All right, well, hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 418th New Social Environment. I'm Mick Bennett, the Special Projects Editor here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Raquel Rabinovich, Anne McCoy, and Alex Bacon. We're thrilled to have the poet Rachel Levitsky here, who will read to close today's program. A few quick notes before we get started. Uh, we'd like to start by thanking the Dermot Company for supporting this month of the new social environment as the rail is celebrating its 21st anniversary this October. You can learn more about the Dermot Company and the rail's curatorial projects at 66 Rockwell through the links that we will post in the chat in just a moment. The first is that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second is an acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter. The heart of both of these statements, acknowledgements, is a commitment to the liberation of the oppressed and solidarity for all who struggle for freedom, and recognition that when it comes to liberation, our histories never unfold in isolation, as said by the great Angela Davis. In that spirit, I encourage you all to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions we will post in just a moment. But now to introduce today's guest and host, New York-based Argentinian-American artist Raquel Rabinovich is known for monochromatic paintings and drawings, large-scale glass sculpture environments, and site-specific stone sculpture installations along the shores of the Hudson River. Her work is also informed by her love of poetry, seen in her series of works on paper titled When Silence Becomes Poetry. Rabinovich has been the recipient of numerous grants and fellowships, including the 2011-2012 Lee Krasner Award for Lifetime Achievement from the Pollock Krasner Foundation, and is included in the oral history program of the Smithsonian Institution Archives of American Art. Her exhibition at Hutchinson Modern is on view, and we will post a link to the chat and encourage everyone to go visit that show. Uh, our hosts for today are New York-based sculptor, painter, and art critic, Anne McCoy, who is an editor at large here at the Brooklyn Rail. She lectured at the Yale School of Drama for 10 years and taught in the art history department at Barnard College for 20 years. She is known for her large scale drawings and sculpture. And in 2019, she was awarded a John Simon Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship. Last but not least, curatorial associate at the Princeton University Art Museum, Alex Bacon is an art historian based in New York City who regularly writes criticism and organizes exhibitions of both contemporary and historical art. Bacon is co-editor with Hal Foster of a collection of essays on Richard, ha Richard Hamilton, published by MIT Press, as well as the author of texts in various exhibition catalogs and edited volumes. Without further ado, Anne and Alex, take it away. Hey, uh, I'm so thrilled to have Raquel today. This is this is wonderful. I mean, Raquel is such a historical figure. What Raquel grew up in Cordoba and went to medical school three years behind Che Guevara, which is kind of amazing. She was a political prisoner under Perón, and she uh, fled her country several times because of the political situation. Had an an international life in Paris, Copenhagen, New York, Argentina. And, and um, when she was in Argentina, she used to sort of pop in and have uh, tea with uh, Borges. So Raquel is certainly an interesting woman. I, I, I'm, uh, I'm so thrilled to be able to do this. I brought Alex Bacon in because Alex, I introduced, I did a, inter, a conversation with Raquel in the Brooklyn Rail. And then I brought Alex in because Alex, uh, is wonderful and very well-trained art historian when it comes to abstraction. And uh, he's also done a catalog of Raquel. And I think for all of you, you should check out the, the uh, edition, the special edition of the Brooklyn Rail that Alex Bacon did on Ad Reinhardt. I think it is probably one of the most brilliant, compl complex, interesting, uh, portraits of an artist I've ever seen. He fought, he got every kind of critic from sort of the Greenbergians to, to the shaman up in Canada. He brought in uh, artists who've known Greenberg. I mean, it's encyclopedic and it's wonderful. So without much ado, Alex and I are both going to talk for just a few minutes each on why we were attracted to Raquel. Um, my art historical background is very different from Alex's. I'm was tr not trained in the same way. <clears throat> I came in through a back door of Southwest archaeology, 
which is a, um, so I guess I would call my art historical approach the Druid school. I, um, I think that was why I was so interested in Raquel's work because I had spent a lot of time in archeology span museums sorting pot shards and also, uh, I grew up in a in the Southwest in Colorado and New Mexico, and um, where the sort of the Latin world was part of the the picture. And also, I had a I have a minor in geology, oddly enough, from the University of Colorado. So I was very interested in Raquel's work because I see history in a very different way that involves stratigraphy, that goes back to the Pleistocene, that uh, that where the things like geological deposits and, and alluvial fans and deposits in rivers are really as much a, as a part of the story as sort of the written text. Uh, this is a, and that's why I was really interested in Raquel's work because she has gathered, she was, as uh, she read Calvino's Invisible Cities where Kublai Khan sends Marco Polo out to sort of, uh, as an ambassador to describe cities. And that's sort of what Raquel did. She sent people out to, you know, to Vernassi, to the Ganges, to the Mekong and the Laos, to the Mississippi River, to the Nile in Egypt. And all of these people brought back deposits. And these deposits are really a, also a, 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 kind of un, a kind of history. And this is what interested me about the work because I come from a part of the world where dirt or is also has a very different meaning. I, as a child, I went to the Sanctuario at Chimayo, which has the healing dirt in the floor. I went to the Apache maiden rituals where the Apache maidens would not only be anointed with cattail pollen, but also dirt from the four corners. So I really thought that her mud works were extraordinary. Uh, she's in a kind of school with people like Michelle Stewart, who did mud works, but I think Raquel's are very, very different because Raquel's are really kind of histories. And I, for what I really like about Raquel's work is that is her library of scrolls, I think it was one of the most brilliant works of art I've ever seen. I've always been interested in things like the Dead Sea Scrolls that couldn't really be opened. I guess now they can be opened with you know, a laser imagery or something, but this idea of scrolls that couldn't be opened so that there were meanings that were mysterious and went beyond what our you know, literary discourse can really describe. And it is this kind of mystical element that really has interested me in Raquel's work. Also, I first saw her work, the, the glass pieces at the Jewish Museum, and I think it was at Lincoln Center, where she had kind of these large glass uh, 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 sort of like, uh, pieces that were sort of like temples that you couldn't enter. And so Raquel has also been very interested in things like Nepali temple complexes where relics are buried and can't be seen. So it is this, this I think that what interests me in Raquel's work so much is the fact that you have to enter the scrolls through a kind of imagination. And I think that this is something that's much more common in the Latin world than it is in the American world. I think Americans are you know, so earnest and God, I, I think of, uh, it's a very different, that kind of the earnest Protestant world is very different, I think, from the Latin world or the Latin world with in, where you have indigenous practices that also come through. So um, I don't have too much more to say about Raquel's work. I would, I would recommend, uh, I think that it's very, very much a part of the, of the Latin world of Borges and Neruda and Garcia Marquez, I think that, uh, and I think that, uh, I, and I think I would like to turn it over to Alex. I, if you had sort of two art historical schools, I would be sort of the Druid school at 180 degrees, and Alex would be more the kind of the Hal Foster world at 180. And if you sort of cobbled Alex and I together as sort of a strange androgyne, I guess you would get the 360 degrees. So I'm hoping that Alex can fill us in on the other half. Alex, take it away. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Anne, for that, that introduction. <laughs> I don't know if I can fill in all the remaining parts of art history um, for that, but uh, it is true, as you said, that a lot of my work has focused on abstraction and um, also that when Barbara Rose and I did that 
Broken Rail uh, special issue on Ad Reinhardt, that this was around the time uh, I think that you uh, were doing your interview with, with Raquel. Um, maybe it was a bit after, I think, a few months uh, after. And, and then you immediately thought of Raquel as someone that would be of interest to me, given you know my interest in Reinhardt and this sort of ideas of slow looking and and um, and things like that, and 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 it was true. And so I was so pleased uh, because you know I've been so happy to sort of maintain a relationship with Raquel uh, since then, visiting her in Rhinebeck and seeing uh, the several exhibitions that she's done in the past. Gosh, I guess it's now been about seven years that I've known Raquel and um, been sort of amazing to see her consistency in that time, uh, her sort of, you know, attention to going to the studio every day, which perhaps she'll talk about, but her studio is part of her home upstate and, um, and she's seated there now. And when you visit, you know, the quality of the light and the sort of way that you look out into the, the forest, like it's all very much a part of the work and it's a sort of interesting context for it because also in her backyard, she has installed uh, these works with stones, which I think we'll perhaps also touch on today. Um, so there are these amazing pieces that she does both in the landscape as it is at her home where she places stones uh, around. And then there's also work where she takes stones and places them uh, in riverbeds. So again, you, you mentioned Anne, the amazing series that she did uh, with, with mud from rivers. And then there's also these sort of temporal, uh, you know, site-specific site works that she does um, outside in the river. And these sort of exist also as films. Um, so, you know, there's this whole spectrum of her work. You know, she's not only a painter, she's also a prolific draftswoman. Uh, I guess you could say, and I think drawing is very central to her practice. And in a way, those scrolls uh, with the river mud are, are drawings of a sort. And um, so, yeah, so I've been sort of captivated by the great range of her work. And again, like I said, I think the first connection that I felt, uh, you know, coming from that project on Reinhardt and sort of the way that in Ad Reinhardt's late work, you have this sort of slow unfolding where you look at one of these black paintings and slowly forms emerge and disappear. And there's, you know, they seem at first to be monochromatic, you know, works, but in fact, they're quite full and diverse within the sort of, you know, close valued color. And in fact, that's often what uh, we find in Raquel's paintings and drawings is this attention, which is very hard to reproduce. So again, I think all day, we're going to be looking at these images and having to discuss what you sort of can and cannot detect in, in a photograph. But nonetheless, when you see these paintings in person, they're quite in that same sense as Reinhardt, they're very full because you have that sort of emerging, disappearing form. And you also have often a, a sort of visibility of mark making, which is quite wonderful to see. There's, they're often quite dense, rich surfaces. And then uh, as you might also get a sense, even from those few uh, installation images that we've already seen of her current exhibition, which I highly recommend because it really is a sort of survey of a lot of these different facets of Raquel's work. So it's a wonderful introduction to people who maybe aren't familiar with her, uh, with her practice. But you'll see that in a lot of these works, she embeds language, and, and numbers. And so there's often this sort of initial, very um, formal reading of sort of painting. And then this a textual element emerges over time. And there's these wonderful a dialogue with poetry as Anne and, and Nick both mentioned, uh, which I hope we'll discuss uh, more because of course, as you said, Anne, there's that personal relationship with someone like Borges and there's also other poets that uh, Raquel continues to be engaged with. And I believe, in fact, one of her most recent series of drawings is, is itself an homage uh, to a particular poet. Um, so, so yes, I think in a way, maybe those are our two pulls. And like we have a sort of interest in the way that uh, this formal approach that she has 
can reveal this sort of plenitude of meaning that can be unpacked along many different lines. And so I believe as well that there is a sort of rich sort of spiritual tradition that she mines and uh, as well as a sort of formal tradition. And, and, you know, for example, someone that Raquel has been in conversation with over many years and is a sort of neighbor of sorts of hers is Jasper Johns. And perhaps we'll talk about that. Um, so in a way she is also a part of a tradition uh, of painters sort of extending from, you know, of course, now that she's in her ninth decade of life, uh, it's amazing all the people and movements and, you know, that she's been able to engage and as you said, a sort of global traveler. And I'm excited for us to look at uh, different works from throughout her career because it's amazing to see, you know, what she did in Copenhagen, what she did in Edinburgh, um, and, you know, and also in New York and out on Long Island. And, uh, you know, there's this amazing consistency, but also you can see that she was always a voracious uh, reader and explorer of her surroundings and that all these things inform her work Paris. She lived in Paris uh, for a few years, I think in the 1990s. So really there's so much to discuss. And with that, I think we should really turn it over to Raquel herself. Uh, maybe pick up some of these threads that we absolutely posted. and her show incidentally is up at Hutchinson Modern until the 6th of November so anyone who can rush into Hutchinson Modern you have the chance to see it so let's 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 hit it Raquel are you ready to, you're up <laughs> Nick do you want to bring up the slideshow great Okay. Um, when I look at my exhibition of trans subjects of modern and contemporary, I well before I say that, I really want to thank Anne, Alex, Nick, Lucia, Isabella, because they have been wonderfully supportive and encouraging and and it feels so much gratitude. So now I can talk about my work. In terms of tradition, like Alice mentioned, there are different stages of my life, uh, beginning maybe with the 70s, in the present. And uh, looking at that, I noticed like a thread, like an invisible thread, connecting through all different mediums, like the sculpture, painting, and drawing. Something that I don't know for the other senses that I can see connected to the case, geography, time element, medium, something that is there even if you don't see. Um, I have got some like turning points in my life, in my art and life. And I want to begin with the first one that was in the sixth. Just returning to Buenos Aires from Europe, um, I began painting series. I usually paint in series, like many pieces at the same time. And um, I was about finishing there for an exhibition that was going to happen soon after. And I proceeded to make a book entitled The Dark. The dark is light enough. And that really struck me because it embodies everything that I did. It was that series of paintings for us. So I decided that that would be the title for that. The dark is light enough. And I said turning point because even after I realized that the source of my work, whatever or whatever it happened, came from that source which is not articulated, it's not visible, silent and dark, in a metaphorical way, maybe literal, because I believe that we can see the dark, we can see it. Then, what happened is that after that, I moved with my family to the US. 
I have a version for Ireland and then children in New York City and now in upstate New York. So what happened to the source? What did it mean to me? Basically, I think it's a fascination about how <coughs> something that is concealed or hidden emerges into me. This emergence that really interests me. And that happens usually slowly. It's like a process that has to be, where we have to be totally connected with. I say that for me, making art, and also for the viewer. For the viewer, it would be a sort of alert, like an archaeologist, digging out something that we don't see but it's there, and then bringing to the light, bringing to the beginning. So that uh, paradox, I think, has been central to my account. Is how we make, how I communicate in a visual language something that is artificial, okay? or something that is very complex, not articulated in the poetry or literature, but that emerges into consciousness, I think is part of that. That's why many, many times I have been using numbers or networks or poetry or excerpts from writers like Antino. So all that connects to the source or the things come from. In that series called the National Five that we're looking at now, and maybe also the next one, Nick, um, you can see I, I, I chose a very basic form that is not complicated, that is interesting, and then how that emerges in this form. So that was like a beginning in this country, in New York, working with that fascination. So maybe we can move to the next one. Next, please. Next. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jumping, which is okay for me, this is not a, like a linear composition, but I'd rather go to the left, to the right, to the first and the past, and the left, because I think it's all connected. Um, during the um, 70s, doing those pieces that you just saw there, you mentioned five, uh, I had a dream, and in the dream, with those paintings detached themselves from the walls and they came first time in the center of my studio and I noticed that they became transparent. And that was like an obsessive image that came back again and again. And then I thought I should investigate it because it was me. And I sort of discovered that if they were to be sculptures and they were to be transparent, they have to make made out of cloth. But I didn't know how to do it. So I reached out to this called uh, Experiment in Art and Technology, EAT. And that, uh, it was created, I think, by Russian Lloyd to facilitate the connection between artists and maybe um, technicians or philosophers, geographers. Poets, when artists didn't know how to address issues in their work, so we would go to someone to dialogue with, and then that intervention facilitated the problem. So that happened to me, it was an engineer specializing in materials, and then he taught me how to use glass, how to cut it, how to glue it, how to put pieces together. And after that, I began doing installations in different places, mostly in New York, also in other cities. And I began using and making a, a maquette, a skateboard in my studio. I think we have some of those at American Society today in an exhibition. And those two um, maquettes are works which I did in, in, in such specific locations. One was entitled um, Cloister Crossing Passageway 1.32. And another one was called um, 
the map is not done. So in many ways, the title is sort of a clue of what might be revealed in the sculptures. Using tinted glass, either gray or bronze, and allow for the viewer to walk around like a Sid Campbell made it then, or sometimes to enter them, but confronted with these little panels of glass. And in doing that, you could see from nothing when it was all dark because of the accumulation of language, or everything when it was just one time. So this going from nothing to everything, and from everything to nothing, was very, very important to me, very precious. And I could see how later on, I did that with, with sculptures and with the stone that Alex mentioned, that consisted installation on the shores of the Hudson River at the edge of the river. We will see images later, but I can just mention them. Using stones to create those systems where the tide will interact with them, it happened that it disappeared from the bottom leaf when the tide was high. And slowly, as the tide will receive, the sculptures will appear and come into view. Totally before the tide. And again, you could see nothing at high time, slowly being emerging into view, and everything before the tide. So I think this fascination with the process of immersion, with the submersion, is all over my work, being drawing, painting, installation. So maybe we can move to the next one. Um, Nick, uh, Nick, uh, we are getting some comments. Uh, Raquel is a little bit muffled. Is there a way that maybe she could put on a headset? Um, yes, I'm actually coordinating with Lucia in the background on that. Okay, great, because we want to hear her better, and she's so wonderful. And these people that we want to have do that. That would be great. Thank you so much. We're okay now. <clears throat> that's much better, actually. Can you hear me well? Yes, that's much better. Should I speak louder? <clears throat> that's better. That's the much room better. room is very, a lot of echo in the large studio space. I think mm -hmm. that may be the main issue. Yeah, maybe while we have the headphones um, set up, maybe Anne or Alex, if you want to comment on the images here while we get that set up for Raquel. I think these are wonderful. It was funny these that that one the one of the pieces was shown. I remember at the Jewish Museum, and the title was Cloister, and it was so funny because uh, Raquel had when she was a, a little girl, uh, she lived in a in a home where Yiddish was spoken and there were lots of, of relatives and it was a very lively place. And so she used to go down the street to a, 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 a church. And so silence was always very important to her. And the thing that I find interesting about these glass pieces is that I, you can't really go inside. So sort of the sanctum sanctorium, the inner chamber, uh, it's sort of like the in a Jewish temple where you can't go into the space of the Ark of the Covenant or in the Tibetan temples where it is buried in, in the relics are buried in the interior. So there was something wonderful about these as sort of sacred spaces that you could enter through the imagination, but not physically. Uh, they're very moving. I remember I saw it was years ago and I still remember the pieces. It, so I, I'm so glad that these are in the setup. Um, I know, I mean, I think it's very interesting because it sort of differentiates them, for example, from Larry Bell's use of the sort of spatial glass because you have in, in Larry's work, the sort of boxes, which then by the end of the 60s, early 70s, he starts to place the glass spatially, but it's very much in keeping with that sort of moment of, of minimalism and, and um, site-specific art, it's about sort of entering and moving. And so it's very interesting Hello. that Raquel introduces her again. work and, and creates more of something, like you said, and that's sort of like the painting, something that reveals and conceals, but doesn't fully uh, allow you to enter. 
It's funny. I lived next door to Larry Bell for years. He's a oh, good I know. <laughs> and it's, it's funny because you could always kind of go through. He would place the, the glass like at the pace shows at right angles and you could go through. So it was a very, very different a yep. different phenomena. And also the boxes, the Larry Bell boxes were transparent and the sculptures were transparent. They had none of these dark, mysterious interiors, the way Raquel's work does, which had a completely, were completely different. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Is it okay? Perfect. Perfect. We, we, we got it. Okay. Much, much mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, all these elements of paradox and metaphors were central to what I was trying to convey with my art. And you mentioned silence, which is absolutely important and basic to me, because in that source that I mentioned, say the dark source, there is silence and there is non-visibility. But it's not really true in essence, because though it is dark, metaphorically and literally, what happens there is that we don't see it because we don't dig it out, because we don't know how to reach that. And the silence doesn't mean that there's nothing there, because we can also listen to the silence. Poetry and art emerges from there. So what I think I try to do with my art is to enact the emergence from that source. And I do it again with different media in different stages of my different decades of work. Um, maybe we can go to the next one, Nick. Okay. Um, during the time that I was doing all these glass installation environments, um, parallel to that, like um, I think Alex mentioned, drawing was always very, very important to me. So I did this series called Temples of the Blind Windows, where um, I use different layers in walls and charcoal and graphite, and I use uh, rubber stamps to ink letters. If you see well, you will see a magic square. And magic square has a mythical significance for me. It's another way of communicating something indirectly because art is an indirect language. We cannot just jump into it and pretend that we see and understand everything. We don't engage in that slow process of getting right into the depth of the work and then slowly emerging from that space. I think we miss it. And the numbers imply that enter the, I mean, how we can enter into the magic square and the mythical significance. Can we look at the text one, please, Nick? Okay. Um, now we are in the 80s, where you saw <clears throat> the previous glass installation called Invisible Cities at the Bronx Museum. Parallel to that, I did a series of drawings, also called Invisible Cities. They were based on a wonderful book by Italo Calvino called Invisible City. So I took the name from the title of the book. And then you can see the medium I use. And again, there was a text embedded into the drawing that was an expert for each drawing, a different one from the book. And I want to read you that one because I think it's very, very meaningful. Before I read, I want you to understand that that book by Calvino, where is a dialogue in between Marco Polo and the Kublai Khan, where they, get, they engage in dialogue. The Kublai Khan cannot see all the cities in his very, very vast empire. So he asks Polo, to go to those distant cities and then go back to him and describe them. And that will be the way for him to see them I and mean, in quote unquote. And this one, for instance, it says, memorous images, once they are fixed in words, are erased, Polo said. 
Perhaps I am afraid of losing Venice all at once if I speak of it. Or perhaps speaking of other cities, I have already lost it little by little. So it's very powerful because it implies all of the things I wanted to convey to you, describing or sort of sharing my process, my interest, my fascination, my approach to this and to that. And it's very poetic too, because it's also, it's like, like the city is again a metaphor. And the way to, in the drawing, which is very architectural in many ways, uh, the intention was that, to, to enact the emergence from that. And um, curiously enough, incidentally, the idea of a Marco Polo going to distant cities and then bring the description or the memory of them to the group like Khan resonated with me many years later, say maybe 15 years ago, 20 years ago, when I began using mud from rivers as a medium to make drawings. Because though I dig, dig out mud, say from the Hudson, from the Ganges in India, many, many of the other rivers, I didn't do it in person. So other people could be friends or people I didn't know or by word of mouth will encounter rivers in their travels and dig it out and put it in a jar or package and then send it to me, give it in person or give it through the mail. And receiving those mud in those packages, it was for me like receiving an alphabet that was not written, that was embedded in the mud. So in a way, those people were the Marco Polos. Instead of bringing me uh, the story of the, of the city or description of the city, they brought me the alphabet for me to, in this unwritten text, be able to dig it out and present it visually. Uh, I could say that the, in those drawings, we're going to see them later, the text is the drawing and the drawing is the text, but the text is unwritten, is implied, is literal and it is metaphorical. Maybe you can next go to the next one, Mick. This is another example with another expert from Calvi. Then we can move on to the next one. Okay. In the late eighties, I did stay in India, in Kathmandu in Nepal, in Bali in Indonesia, in Egypt, with the, you know, the temples there. And it was an, ex an extraordinary experience because there I discovered another culture, all of the very ancient cultures. And I noticed how the temples were like the center of life and art as well. Just to give an example, for instance, go to an Indian temple. To begin with, it was very slow to enter them. Many times there were many concentrated walls around them. So you have to walk, it was like a pilgrimage. You have to walk and walk through all these different walls, reach the temple, and even there, if you want to go to the Santum Santorum, which is the most sacred space of the temple, which is in total darkness, the slowness of getting there was part of the communication, part of the connection with that. And in the Santum Santorum, where we know there were sacred objects placed there, you couldn't see them. So I connected the slowness of the process, how you go like a pilgrimage to reach the space you couldn't see, you didn't know what was there, but was extraordinary, moving and powerful, connecting who people were religious, what that would communicate to them. And to me, it was just the essence of art. And then going to Kathmandu in Nepal, the temples were different. 
they were like like um, like stupas were maybe sometimes very small, very large um, configurations that were enclosed. You couldn't enter them physically. But again, in constructing them, in the Pali word you call them chordons, we know that in the creation of them, sacred objects were placed inside of them. But the, the devotee walking, circumambulated around and around for hours, they didn't know what was inside and they didn't see what was inside. But the extraordinary connection I could see in their faces, in their bodies, connected with that was amazing. And I think that inspired me when I came back to New York to connect with that essence or source where we don't see, we don't know, but emerges into view. And I said again, I like for my art to enact that emergence. So those I call choices. And I figure out in the abstraction, if I use letters or numbers, there is nothing you can read literally, but I think that evoke a language that we have to discover for ourselves. Because art is not a given, it has to be discovered for each one of us, the viewer too. Let's move to the next one. Uh, you cannot see very well here, I just mentioned what's about. The series was called Light and Warm, which is a beautiful way to relate, again, what is the light, do we see it, what's in there? Like for me, the light comes from the dark. And use it in the negative. Like you see here, it is not noble, it is not a noble. There is this ambivalence that I think it invites us to investigate and to see beyond the surface. If all is appearance, then we don't know what is behind. If we can go through the appearance, what is on the surface, then we can enter that extraordinary well world that will reveal to us, which we otherwise we couldn't access or see or understand. And there is tremendous richness and revelations. Like for instance, I compare that to another source of inspiration or connection. Like for instance, in mythology, say Greek mythology, we have for instance, Persephone and Demeter and Hades in the, under, in the underworld. And how the idea of taking Persephone into the underworld and the desperations of Demeter to get her out of that she has to understand that it was the, of the essence that Persephone would be in the dark in the underworld in order to understand something that she couldn't otherwise. So that for me is also what happens to art when I make it and when I contemplate it. So that series, I think connects with that. Um, please make the next one. Uh, when I moved through, okay, let me go back a little bit. So I was in India, in Nepal, in Indonesia, connecting to these ancient cultures and traditions. That was somehow to a turning point. Because going to those places from New York City, where I was, I felt I was like in a trap because the, the New York City, the art world in those times, were so competitive, it was very fast, it was about celebrity, it was about, you know, something that is spectacular, people didn't connect in any spiritual way, like the essence of art was to me lost there, I couldn't see it, I couldn't access it. So that search for something that could connect me, what I was searching for, I did find in those places. So in the temples, I realized oh, in the Chordas that stone was the basic element to build them. So stone was everywhere. 
So it became sacred in the way it was used and the way it was perceived. And that really touched me deeply. When I came back to New York, I felt I didn't want to live in the city anymore because I was able to touch that other world, call it magical or transcendent world, really resonated deeply with me and I with that. And that invited me to move from the city to the countryside. And what I did was to move to upstate New York. And as you mentioned before, I think Anne and Alex, I live in a total rural setting. I have my beautiful studio, like a temple, and I have the forest or the woods in the back of the property where I began creating pieces like this, which I call Pavavikas, because that's a, I think it's a, it's a Pali word, or Sanskrit word, I don't remember. That means immersion into view, constant state of emergence. And that's what happened with stone, because the earth, the core of the earth is all rock and stone. And you, when you are in a rural setting, it's everywhere. Most of it, you don't see it because it's the earth itself. You got to dig it out or encounter them already emerged. So I was able to get stones from local quarries where I lived. And some of them were already in that property. So the idea of building them among the trees, being in the context of nature, day and night, winter, summer, being covered by the snow in the winter, covered by the leaves in the fall, um, coming to life with the light in the spring and summer, evoke all of that. They are in a constant state of emergence. But later on, um, Connecting with that, I thought, how can I take it a little bit further than that? How I can communicate all this source of emergence in a different way? Not different, but enhanced, say more extreme. Um, looking at the river that goes, you know, in, in the area where the Hudson River Valley, I was close to the river, to the Hudson River. Oh, this is another example of Pavavikas. This is winter, so they're beginning to be covered by the snow. Um, but then um, I noticed, observing the river, that it changed, the edge of the river was never fixed. It kept on changing constantly. It was ambivalent. There was no separation, ni separation because the earth, the water, sometimes the sky. So then I wanted to see what happened if I will build my sculptures at just at the edge of the river. So they would be subject to the tides. It meant they could be totally invisible at high tide. This is like mid tide. This is a piece I did in Biko. Maybe we can see another one. Next, please. This is on another side in Nayak. It's here we can see the configuration of the stones submerged. But in the next one, I would like to see you the next one. They're totally revealed because they emerge from concealment under the water to be at low tide, totally visible. So these cycles of emergence and submergence, they will come and go six hours at a time. And again, I connect it to the slow process of that. It will take six hours mm. if the viewer wants to see that, total from nothing to everything and from everything to nothing. Um, I myself, every time I finish one of those pieces, I say finished, but they're never totally finished because say completed because they keep on changing. The currents, the weather, the tides, the water, they are constantly different. So every time you want to see them, they're not the same. 
It was a Heraclito who said, you can never step in the same river twice. Here, you can never see the same sculpture twice. So observing that process, the six hours, I noticed that the, in the bed of the river, the mud always was in the dark, never, never was visible. So it occurred to me, it occurred to me to dig it out from the dark and begin using it as a medium to make drawings. The first time I did that was in India, in Varanasi, a very sacred city by the Ganges. So I was able to dig out mud from the Ganges. And then I, I had like an improvised studio at the hotel where I was staying. And I began using paper from there and applying the mud, the dry mud onto the paper. Then I develop a system in which I will mix the mud with water and an adhesive so that we will dry the drawing, you can see it here. It wouldn't um, flow away or, or be uh, disappear. And I call this river library because to me, the river was like a library to me. All these drawings that I made using the mud like I mentioned before, it was like an alphabet for me. When I said footnotes, I mean, I made me very, very tiny drawings that I will glue to the bottom of the page, implying that they are footnotes. Because in books, at least when I read, many times the most important part of the text was in the footnote. So I wanted to imply that, that you have to look what appears to be like a book, it has pages. There are layers of pages superimposed, so you can perceive them even if you don't can see all of them. And this took me to the scrolls, which are maybe we can see now. Those, those are more of the same. So at one time, um, I wanted to get to another extreme of that fascination in a visual way. So I began rolling up individual drawings in such a way that I, I will glue them at the edge when they were totally rolled up like a scroll. And then you would never open them again so you couldn't see them but you knew they were there and you per could perceive them. And for a, an exhibition I did, um, I think Anne knows about that, like, or Alex about that many years ago. Um, I built a table and then I used maybe 200 of the scrolls I did with many, many rivers from all over the world. And in turn, I glued the scrolls to the table. So that was like magical to me because I could see all the world in one place and one place in the world. There is the gallery installation. And then later on, I did another group of these scrolls. Maybe we can go to the next one, Nick. Using sediment from other rivers, as you can see they're much darker. Probably that's, those are the Mississippi, or maybe the um, Hudson River, where the, the, the mud is very dark and very dense. Um, so that is very compelling to me because it was another way where I can see the thread connecting thoughts, ideas, intentions, intuition, bringing it to different media. Uh, maybe you can see the next one, Nick. Um, okay, how we got here. If you remember the temples of the blind windows with magic square, where you see the numbers. Here I draw a magic square. You can barely see it because it's barely emerging into view, but there are no numbers because I thought 
I think it's a mistake. There are not stamps. There are no rubber stamps on my paper here. But you know, it's the inscribed magic square that you can barely see, barely merge into view, which evokes something that is present in its absence, which is the numbers. I, I went back to the theme of the magic square because of the fascination it had with me. Can we go to the next one, please? Um, this is a painting, Thresholds. Uh, again, you can barely see what they are, but they are letters. There is, with letters at the bottom, it says footnotes. And then some of the letters like A for O, T, N, will be inscribed into the painting and then it was embedded into the painting. So you, they were barely emerging into view, but again, the viewer has to submerge into the painting in order to emerge from the source or the essence, and then maybe discover something within themselves, which this invites to do. Because that connection between the artwork and the viewer, it seems to me, it has to go beyond the appearance. It takes time, it's slow, that like emerges is by the river. But if we don't take the time, we don't see, even in the dark, literally. If you take the time to be in the dark, things will appear. But if you say, I don't see anything, then you miss it completely. And going back to Alex, who mentioned Reinhardt, I remember many years ago, when I was um, working at the Whitney Museum in the education department, many times I would take people, you know, visitors to the museum to see the collection. And every time we would be in front of Reinhardt, systematically everybody would walk by because they didn't see anything. And as you know, Reinhardt is extraordinarily rich behind the appearance. You have also to take time, slow, and then the emergence will happen in that slow time. So I relate a lot to that too. It just resonated with me. You don't see anything because it's dark. And that doesn't mean depressing or sad or difficult, or painful. It's extraordinary because it has everything and nothing. What is next, uh, Ernik? Mm -hmm. And again, Alex mentioned this. Um, for me, it has been very, very important, my connection always with poetry and literature. Um, I love poetry and resonate in millions of ways with poetry. If you come to my studio, you're going to see books all over from different poets. So I'm painting, drawing, and then I stop, open a book at random, read that page, feel totally, you know, um, excited and connected, resonating with the poetry. And that inspired me to do a series of drawings uh, that I call When Silence Becomes Poetry, implying again that poetry and art comes from a source of silence and darkness. When things are not yet articulated, when the thoughts are not articulated yet, when before all of that, before language, before, as we know it. And that inspired me to do, for instance, this is for a poet um, who lives in the Hudson Valley, George Quasha, and this is a watercolor. Maybe we can see the next one too. And I'm sorry, can we walk back to that? Um, so for that, I made a suite, maybe six or eight drawings with watercolor. But it's not a representation of, the po of a particular poem. It's rather my visual response to the poetry itself. 
And I did more, another for instance, the next one. I, th I think this is for Jorge Luis Borges. It's like a collage into the drawing, into the paper. Maybe we can go to the next one, please. This is for Italo Calvino, that for me is really a great poet, not only a fiction writer. And again, you can see that it's not a representation of a poem in particular, but it is my visual response to the poetry itself. Another one, please. Next, uh, Nick. I think this is actually our last image of the slideshow. Okay. Um, do you know how much longer do we have? We are, we're flexible on time today. Um, okay. We could, you, if you'd like to continue or if, if Anne and Alex, you want to maybe join in. We, sure. We're okay on time though, there's no rush. Mm -hmm. I think that it was wonderful. I mean, I remember Alex Bacon saying, uh, Raquel and I were both saying that, that there were, uh, that, you know, Reinhardt spent more time on a painting, spent so much time on a painting and that young people today, you know, do 50 paintings in the time that Reinhardt did one. I mean, I think I was, as Raquel was talking, I was thinking uh, Thomas Merton and Ad Reinhardt were very good friends. And uh, Thomas Merton had an Ad Reinhardt in his monast in his uh, cubicle at his monastery. And I think that, that Raquel brought up something that's so important. And that is that we live in a kind of, what you see is what you see. And people are so used to kind of advertising images and just glancing at something that, uh, you know, I often wonder when I'm at a place like the Rubin Museum, if somebody can actually sit and meditate on a work like a Tonka anymore. I mean, this lack of the ability, I mean, so much of Raquel's work that you see here, you should really see her show because there's such an aura to the work and, and it doesn't reproduce in the, it, as well as when it, you really have to experience the work. And, um, I think that it, it's been, this show was like a little gem, and I would recommend uh, rushing up to Hutchinson Modern before Saturday, or including Saturday, to see the work in its in its completeness. Alex, do you want to say something, sweetie? Uh, <clears throat> yes, you have one more week to see the show. Um, yes, no, I mean I think this is an important uh, you know question. I think that you know. It's sort of obvious that we live in a time of, you know, s speedy, uh, you know, information overload. Like we all know this, and I think that um, in a way, uh, this work becomes more legible in this context. I think with Reinhardt, you know, as as has been mentioned, really struggled with people getting people to even look at his paintings um, in the fifties and sixties, and I think in a way, actually. Uh, what's exciting about this kind of work is because I think that as much as people are maybe used to, again, that information overload, I think that there is a sort of interest in work or experiences, let's say, which slow us down and which require attention. I mean, I think you can see this culturally, this sort of rise, which is maybe another topic, but you know, there's a sort of, you know, rise in wellness and meditation. And a lot of people are interested, you know, that weren't interested before. I think there's a reaction, you know, as much as this sort of pace of life becomes ever quicker, I think also it creates a space uh, of people that are looking for that, uh, you know, uh, experience that slows them down. And I think it actually creates the perfect um, stage for art like Raquel's. Also, I think Raquel said something that I found really resonated, and that was when she was talking about the underworld. The Thonian aspect is something that people have really don't understand today because they don't understand things like the Eleusinian mysteries anymore. And going into the underworld, I mean, Prometheus did it, Christ did it, everybody did it. And going into the underworld, going into the darkness as a place of, uh, of revelation is important. I think that one of the most wonderful uh, contemporary texts on this is William Kentridge's uh, Yale, uh, uh, Harvard, I'm sorry, Harvard uh, lectures, where he, called, where he talks about 
the importance of darkness. And, and he, used, he, taught, he uses Plato's cave saying that, that going into the darkness is, is really just as important as this kind of obsession with the, the bright lights and the heliocentric. And I think that what you said about the Thonian and the underworld was wonderful because for me, the underworld is also the unconscious. Thank you, Anne, thank you. Invite me to say something else. Um, <clears throat> resonated with that again, and I mentioned turning points. Another for me was visiting the Lascaux caves in the mm -hmm. south of France. They were done totally, totally in the dark. They were extraordinary experiences for me. And how with a flashlight, because we couldn't, one, like two people at a time, because the um, respiration there they will damage the paintings, I mean, the, the cave paintings, yeah. or maybe the light also will destroy them, will be one or two at a time with a flashlight. So also they have to, they were emerging into view from me. Because walking into this dark cave, literal dark cave, you didn't see anything. And with a very dim flashlight, the extraordinary paintings gradually came into view. So that was a turning point to me as well. And another one, again, about that was visiting Machu Picchu in Peru these extraordinary stone ruins, which, you know, they are there from many centuries ago. And when I was there, spending the night at the ruins, I could see everything, it was a moonlight, moon, moon, uh, sorry, full moon night. Then at the dawn, Machu Picchu disappeared from view completely. And then very slowly and gradually, the clouds covering the ruins began lifting. And very slowly, Machu Picchu came into view again. And talking to Anne at one point, I remember she asked me about Machu Picchu. And a click, you know, at the moment revealed me that though I didn't know at the time of looking at Machu Picchu, Somehow, 20 years later, emergencies recreated that. This time, it wasn't the clouds covered in the ruins, stone, but the tides covered in them. But it's a very similar experience and process. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to remember that. Wonderful. Uh, Anne or Alex, do you have any other questions or do you want us to go into I was, I was looking at Rachel Fetterman from the Morgan Library had just sure. kind of an interesting question where she's asking Raquel, uh, uh, I had mentioned uh, like the, 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 the books made with earth that Michelle Stewart did. Michelle Stewart also did this huge sort of scroll things that came down mountains with mud. That if Raquel knew, I do you want to read it? I, I'm coming up on a cataract operation. I can hardly read the print. Sure, I'll um, actually, I'll just, I'm going to pass the mic over to Rachel. And, that's um, her idea. They're much better. Yeah. You are. <laughs> Hi, Raquel. I saw your show, and it's it's very very beautiful. Um, and I actually had a memory of seeing your show a few years ago at the Y Gallery, and mm -hmm. the artist Helene Elan brought me to see your show, which is is connected to this question, which is. Um, do you consider yourself to have a particular artistic cohort? Who are the artists who you um, look to for inspiration or for support? Could you say the, the, can you ask me again so I can be very clear about the question? Sure. Um, I'm wondering, you know, because we've talked about the relationship between your work and that of Michelle Stewart, you know, do you know Michelle Stewart? Is she someone that you've ever um, well, worked I knew with? Yes, I knew her work very well, but I'd never met her, right? It's a good parallel, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, do you, do, you, could, do you have a cohort of, obviously you're very inspired by poetry. I'm wondering if you have a cohort of visual artists that you would consider as sort of um, crucial to your practice or people that you look to for inspiration, or do you really find inspiration in these spiritual sources mostly that we've been talking about? Yeah. 
Well, artists that inspire me, for instance, um, Morandi, I would say Morandi was extraordinary for me, yeah. Velasquez, the grayness, that for me wasn't like a background, it was like the essence of the world too. At one point I connected very much with uh, Mondrian, how from a famous tree that was totally realistic, gradually over time it became abstracted, total abstraction. Um, I love, for instance, the work of Jasper Jones. I resonate with ambivalence. Is it this color or that color? So the ambivalence in my work too. Is it, can you see everything? Can you not? It's not this, it's not that. All these paradoxes are also central to my work too. Does it answer your question? It does, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Rachel. And yeah, thank you, Rachel. That was great. <laughs> it's lovely to see you back here. Um, if it's okay with you, Anne and Alex, we can, if you'd like, we can keep taking questions from the audience. Great. <clears throat> okay, great. Um, I, I'm going to pass the mic now over to Irene Rousseau. Um, Irene, you should be able to turn on your microphone now. Hi, can you hear us? Yes. There you are. I have known Raquel for many years through the American Abstract Artist. And I just want to let her know, whoops, I'm choking up, how absolutely inspirational her work is for me. Uh, what I especially like or, for, or find a connection with is the silent language of and the passage of time that reveals and hides that have become that have become aspects of her own work. As you look at your work, Raquel, it is the first impression is, hmm, let me look further. It is hidden from me. Thank you, thank you. And then it reveals itself. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very touched by what you say. Yes, thank you so much, Irene, for that very heartfelt um, sharing that with us. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to pass the mic now over to actually our poet of the day, uh, to Rachel. Rachel, you should be able to turn on your mic. Thank you. Thank you both, all three of you so much. This is um, wonderful and very connected to maybe the work I'm going to read, the work I'm going to read. But um, Raquel, I... I couldn't help but feel like there was something, I feel like there is something in your work that is almost a training for the viewer to be able to see in the dark that, and that rather than representing the dark and, and, and its intricacies, you're also, your work also because there's something emerging all the time because you see these hints of what's beyond the dark that it, it, that the after image, the afterglow stays in the mind. And so you're reaching for it. So there's a sort of a motivation to see in the dark. So I guess my question is, 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 is that, is this something that you've thought about like the, the, the interaction and almost like a pedagogy of for meditation in, in, in your, in your viewer? Uh, I don't, I, when I work, it's not premeditated like I, calculate or figure out, I want to do this and that. It doesn't happen like that. Mm -hmm. um, I try to understand afterwards. Even I tightly the pieces afterwards. Mm -hmm. Because once in the process of making them, something is revealed to me that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. It's a mix of intuition and intention that makes me begin to do something. But then the meaning to me is revealed much, much later. Mm -hmm. Could I jump in? Um, because I, I, it made me think of, and, and I wanted to then bring Anne into this, uh, because it, it, it's, I think that, you know, I'd love to discuss further, you know, this idea of emerging from the darkness. And I think it's very important to talk about darkness, again, as this sort of not necessarily negative thing, 
and I mean, we've talked about Reinhardt, but it also, this very beautiful description uh, that you gave made me think of this, I think the most amazing piece of light and space art, sort of West Coast light and space art that I ever had the, uh, you know, sort of honor to see was at the Panza Villa in Italy, this piece by Maria Nordman. And on the door, it says that you have to spend at least 30 minutes in the piece. And so you go in and it's complete darkness. And so you, you have to spend the 30 minutes in this sort of completely dark space. But I mean, it was one of the most incredible experiences because over time, what you would see, you know, I mean, I can't even describe it sort of, you know, you can say things like shadows and corners of the room and things like that, but just the sort of plenitude again, that emerged sort of slowly, but like at this incredibly slow pace, because I mean, 30 minutes was a sort of minimum. And I was amazed because you sort of read that. And then even I was sort of like, okay, we'll see, you know, but then it was like, I felt like I could spend forever and there would always be something new. And I think that that's something that I see again, looking at your paintings. Uh, but I also, because Anne, you know, has a sort of very personal and close relationship to a lot of those West Coast artists. Um, and we already mentioned Larry Bell. I wonder if, and do you also see a relationship between um, Raquel's work and interest in darkness and emergence in uh, these, is some of those artists, like another artist that comes to mind is Eric Orr. Yeah, I was gonna say, actually Maria Nordman was in my consciousness raising group with Lucita Hurtado and all these people. So it's a historical, uh, yeah, I, I think that the, those were the two that I would mention. Uh, Eric Orr was very was also a very good friend of mine. Uh, we were in the Art and Alchemy Venice Biennale together uh, that Arturo Schwartz did. And Eric uh, did a lot of work on darkness, you know, like the shadow piece he did with the blood at the pyramids. And he did, uh, he was very, very interested in dark. And also all of those paintings, the black paintings with the crushed bone and everything. Uh, he was, yeah, and Maria Nordman, I think that I've seen that work. It's an amazing work. I think it's really maybe one of her best pieces. Uh, both of those, both Maria Nordman and, and Eric were really, I mean, they were reading things like alchemy. They were reading Jung. They were reading all kinds of, of things like that. They were uh, big intellectuals in that group. I think a lot of the other light and space people were really interested, you know, like Mary Corse with the white, 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 although even Mary's done a couple black paintings, but uh, the the rest of, you know, like it's hard to imagine say, uh, I don't know, uh, Bob Irwin doing a black room, but. Right, well, I think these again are these sort of poles of, um, of that movement. You have sort of uh, Maria Norman and Eric Orr who deal with you know, these environments that are sort of appear black and then things emerge. And then you have like Terrell and Irwin who deal more with light and sort of manipulating sort of the visible element of light. Um, and I think, again, I think that Raquel also spans that. I mean, we can, we talked a lot about gray and you can see even behind her that she very much uh, is uh, drawn to gray. But then I think even in the slideshow, we saw pink, pieces and I, I always love this idea. I think actually one of the last series, so I think it was around the year 2000 Raquel that you, um, you did a series of sort of pale pink paintings. And I believe that was the last series of paintings that you did for many years. I believe you turned in the early 2000s uh, very much to those uh, sculptures with rock and uh, to your drawing practice. And it was only actually, I think around the time that we met that you were starting to return to painting. Mm -hmm. And so I always loved the idea that in a way this sort of, I mean, obviously these ended up not being your last paintings by any means and those paintings have still not been made. Um, but the idea that you sort of closed this uh, period of, of the nineties uh, with uh, those sort of bright paintings. So also I think in your work, uh, it's not only the dark, you know, the light, and I think you talked about this, that, you know, these things always coexist, right? It's like a sort of John Cage idea that, you know, like uh, silence also contains uh, noise and is a type of sound and so on. And so 
the dark and the light, I think you even beautifully put the, the for you, the light emerges from the dark rather than vice versa and so on. I like that. Thank you. I think this kind this relates to a question that GE Schwartz asked. Um, GE, I'll uh, I'll pass you the mic now. Thank you so much, and for this wonderful afternoon. Um, I, I, I'm modifying my question a little bit. Um, I, initially, I want to ask: Do you think that uh, Juan de la Cruz, a uh, uh, John of the Cross, is Dark Knight of the Soul? <clears throat> is really a place of creative growth or is it a metaphor of creative growth and is it a manual of creative growth? Mm, I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's not a manual, definitely, but I don't know how to answer in a very precise way because it's ambivalent. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. As an Irish depressive, that was my Bible. So <laughs> yeah, I think that was great. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, GE. Thank you, Raquel and Anne. Um, I'm going to pass the mic now over to our friend, Lynn Crawford. Thank you. This was so beautiful. Um, when you said the river is like a library, Mm -hmm. I just, I love that line. And I, I wonder, do you differentiate between um, reading and looking? Or do they often conflate for you? I think so. Because many times we say, I see it. We use the verb seeing equivalent to understanding. And then I can read you. It means I see you and I understand you. I think mm -hmm. the interchange of words is both. Mm. What do you think? <laughs> I, I kind of think so. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking about it quite often during your presentation today. Just kept coming and I kept mm -hmm. sensing expressions of it, beautiful expressions of it. So mm -hmm. thank you. I, for instance, when I talk or think about the, the river library drawings, where there is nothing literally written in them because I feel there is something embedded through millennia because many of these rivers are thousands of years old. Mm. And because what accumulates in layers, the layers don't mix, it's one on top of the other. Digging out from the river bed, I dig, out all those many of these layers, which in turn I use in layers in my drawings, in each one, and also when I, the configuration when the, I finished with them, is the layer of pages, drawing upon drawing, drawing, which you don't see because you only see the one on the top. Mm. Which is not different when you read a book, yeah. you read one page at a time, but you know their previous pages and other pages. So I refer to that, you know, how do we read, what do we read, how we understand what we're reading. And compelling to me the river library because there is nothing actually written in a language we know, but it is a language. Yes. So this paradox of having written something unwritten is revealing that there is something that comes to us in that language which mm. is non-verbal language. Mm. I hope it makes sense to you. Yes, that's beautiful. In between the lines. Yeah. With the sideless in between the lines as important as the lines themselves. Yeah. The lines. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. And um, I just want to share what an honor it has been today, Raquel, to have you here with us and, and sharing your work with us and um, reminding us to kind of to slow and pay attention uh, mm -hmm. to these, you know, these lines and these in-betweens. Um, I, I also want to share with the audience, if you are available and you're in New York, please do go see the show at Hutchinson Modern. Um, we'll post another a link in the chat again uh, with more details there. But 
Um, I want to share that usually we conclude our, our final question uh, from Fong. He's una unavailable to join us today. He sends his love, but I will turn the mic back to Anne and to Alex uh, to close us out. Um, I'm just I'm just so uh, so honored to be able to. Uh, I, I, it, it's been an honor for me at the rail to be able to do uh, conversations with Raquel and to see the work. Uh, and uh, I'm just, um, I, it's, you know, it's uh, Raquel is 92 and she's just gotten a wonderful gallery, Hutchinson Modern. And, you know, it's, a, it's a, I don't know, it, it's very moving. I mean, it has not been easy for women artists. And that, you know, Raquel all the way through the pandemic was cooking several meals, three meals a day for her husband and working. And I mean, she has such fortitude and she's been such an example for many of us that I just want to say blessings, Raquel. So we send you lots and lots of love. And, and thank you, Alex, you're such a sweetheart. Thank you for involving me in this wonderful conversation. And uh, thank you, Raquel, for making such wonderful art and I feel like you know I'm excited and I think everyone should know that you know you're still so active in the studio and that there's more to come and um you know there are new bodies of work that will soon be emerging uh, following this thank you I think Isabella who is down there but I don't see her <laughs> someplace I'm okay. here and I can <laughs> Thank you. Such a privilege and honor to have your work here at the gallery and to know you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I thank you, Lucia, who helped me a lot. You don't a big, see what is here. A big thanks to Lucia and, and to Isabella. And thank you, of course, Raquel and, and Alex. Um, and Andrea. And Andrea. Andrea, and Andrea, yes. Andrea was the trooper who who did the, the PowerPoint like five times. Yes. <laughs> we, we, <laughs> Yay, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Again, thank, thank you, you Andrea. Andrea. It's so wonderful to have met you and to learn about your work. And it's gorgeous in the gallery. And it's such a privilege to be working with, with you and your work and your, learn about your career. Thank you. And thank you to Fong and the Brooklyn Rail. As I always say, it makes our life so much more interesting. Nick, you know, I'll just tell you that. So thank, you. thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, I, we, we will we'll open it up for everyone to, to, you know, have this avalanche of thank yous like we usually do at the end. But we do, uh, before we go, we, we conclude all of our community events here at the Rail with a poetry reading, and I'm thrilled to welcome our Poet Laureate of the Day, Rachel Levitsky, to the stage. Rachel Levitsky is an, a feminist, avant-garde poet, novelist, essayist, translator, editor, educator, and a founder of Belladonna Collaborative. She is a professor of writing at Pratt Institute, Naropa University, and occasionally for Poets House and the Poetry Project. Uh, she was born in New York City and earned an MFA from Naropa in Boulder, Colorado. And um, without further ado, over to you, Rachel. Thank you. Um, it's just with incredible inspiration that I begin and end the poetry benediction for this amazing event. Um, the, the work that I'm doing is from, that I'm reading is from a series in which all the poems are called Against Travel. And they're very much influenced by Calvino and Borges in a long-term way. And they're also kind of in very connectedly, um, they move toward negation, but not to be negative, but rather to open portals. So I will leave that explanation and just read a couple of poems. This one especially is for both you, Anne, and you, Raquel. It, it's for, it, each of these is for someone, and this one's for Ruth, who is my mother who also escaped from Germany in uh, December 1939. Against travel. Between the course and the course, its precipitation transmogrifies from snow mist to snow, to hail, to snow, to mist, to rain. Along the same river and about it, a big ancestral feeling as if for a change, something good has happened in the zone of memory usually reserved 
for that which keeps us staring at the window not there. No concrete fill, no reconstruction of some eternal shiny city of anyone's dream. It's just a shitty interior wall. Now it's the river that's changed and no more feeling. It's not yet connected by tributary or tribute, just some vague similarities of sound and umlaut. Is an umlaut an accent or a diacritical mark? Anyway, it's pretty here, just the same. In the distance, we see castles we've seen somewhere before. Against Travel, Love Poem, for Sal. Not so long ago, we were standing, one of us a person and the other a screen. That was awkward. One of us, I think the person says, it should be easy. It reminds me of a feeling she had for a feeling. Distraction is the instance, story, the result. Everything gets lost. We manage by narrow escape. I can't blame you for not helping. We don't speak the same language. You don't steer with your clear eyes. Not one of our points is from here, but this isn't a poem about mass extinction or which scene we're in today. It might be about turbulent weather or the stars last night. There were many, they were close. I'll end with this last one. Against travel for Anne. Memory, water, perfect or eternal, together or tout seul, I read slowly, ever more so, as if words are too much unfiltered light from the sun. Today, I read Anne Boyer saying words don't literally burn like matches, but reading this, I squint because they burn so bright. Then when squinting isn't enough against the light, I turn my face away as much as my face, which is a head on a neck will years later turn. Anne's books been put in my bag. My hands are put on the dog. Without word or image, I recall the perfect eternal finite depth of you. It's hot and still weather. French security police flank me, but not because of me. They're young. They too want to and do touch the dog, my dog. They take what they want. And as Anne notes, whether or not my refusal is a poem toward their taking without asking, I perform, perform a language less poem that says no. Mm. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. That was a beautifully, wonderfully connected reading to today's talk. Thank you for Thank that. You. Uh, once again, I want to thank everyone for joining today. Thank you so much, Raquel. Thank you, Alex, and thank you everyone at Hutchinson Modern. Sorry, Hutchinson Modern, uh, Isabella, Andrea, everyone. Um, and we are here every day at 1 p.m. So if you're available, join us on Monday at 1 p.m. for a conversation between artist Crystal Z. Campbell and Andrew Woolbright. We'll conclude with a poetry reading from Kaicha Kuipers. Um, you can now all turn on your microphones to say hello and goodbye. And thank you to Raquel and have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you, Raquel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Raquel. Thank, 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 thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful work. Adios. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I well, wish I felt you at 90. Raquel. Thank you. Um, thank you, Anne. Hi, Alec. I'm sorry I was on the on the meeting, so I missed the whole. Hi, Fong. <laughs> you'll have to, Fong, you can watch the you can watch the video replay. We love you. We miss. I you. will. You'll love it. I will. You'll love it. It's beautiful. Thank you. I can't wait. And go see the show, everyone. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Nick. Mavika. Thank you. Thank you, Fawn. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone, everyone have a beautiful weekend. Yes, have a great beautiful rest Halloween. Of and happy Halloween and blessings to you, Raquel, as Anne said. Thank you so much.
Dance. Thank you. And play the also, Alex. And, and thank you, Lucia. Yes, thank you, thank you Lucia. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Make everyone, you were wonderful. <laughs> much love and courage. Much love. And thank you, Raquel, for your work. And thank, thank you for letting me be inviting me to be here. Yep. Yeah. Thank you to see the show. What an honor. Yes, indeed. Bye, Anne. Okay. Bye -bye, Take care, everyone. Bye. Have a great weekend. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you.